can see that a bit clearer. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting a case report on a luteal phase early pregnancy after a marina coil insertion. Um, and this was for intrauterine septum resection. Uh, so essentially our unit reported an unusual case of an intrauterine single pregnancy with a marina coil in situ. Um, this occurred following elect elective hysteroscopic septum resection for primary subfertility in a 27 year old female. So in this case, the patient continued with the pregnancy and underwent some additional monitoring via ultrasonography. Planned delivery occurred via elective C-section at 39 weeks and a healthy male infant was born. And during a section, interruptive recovery of the marina coil occurred. Um, and that, that was found in the placental membranes at this time. Uh, so given the slight um, kind of unusual nature of this case, we kind of did a literature review and identified really this was sort of a novel clinical scenario with no clear management guidelines. Um, and we also felt that was quite a lot of ethical scope to kind of consider and, and reflect on uh, based on this case um, and more widely in congenital uterine abnormalities. Oh, sorry, I'm just having trouble changing slides. There you go. Uh, so just some more background on hysteroscopic resection. So it generally involves the metroplasy of the septum with the aim of reforming an anatomically normal uterine cavity to facilitate successful implantation. Um, and hysteroscopic resection is a recognised management option, um, particularly for congenital uterine uh, septum, um, but more so in recurrent miscarriage as opposed to in our case uh, when this was done in the instance of primary subfertility. Um, but it is sort of well, well known that in some cases where no other cause for subfertility can be found that uh, a uterine septum resection might be performed in the hope of achieving successful pregnancy. So just some more in our case. So a 26 year old female presented to our primary subfertility clinic at a district general hospital as a smaller unit in the UK uh, following GP referral. And she'd had a three year history of subfertility at this point. Um, in terms of the patient's background, she was, it was quite unremarkable really, so normal regular menstrual uh, cycle, hormones were completely normal, and um, male factor had been excluded at this point already. Uh, so the patient underwent an outpatient hycosy to assess the nature of tubes and uterus, um, and normal sized uterus was found, however there was a um, septum of approximately 1.5 centimetres, uh, and this was further visualised using a 3D scan. Uh, so therefore, um, by nature of management of this, an uh, elective hysteroscopic septum resection was performed and a marina coil was inserted at this time for adhesion prevention. That was due to be removed eight weeks post-procedure and following the procedure, a urine pregnancy test was performed and was negative for the patient and she'd reported that her last menstrual period was three weeks prior. So as per um, routine follow-up of electric his elective hysteroscopic um, resection, uh, the patient received a telephone follow-up and was noted to have missed her period. Um, there was no history of se sexual intercourse post hysteroscopy. Uh, so the patient took a home pregnancy test on advice of our secondary care unit and presented to our early pregnancy unit for a six weeks uh, transvaginal ultrasound scan. Uh, so at this time, we were able to confirm that there was an intrauterine pregnancy uh, as shown in the six week scan figure one. Uh, this was really key just because we know that um, with pregnancies with a marina coil in situ and more specifically marina coil failure, there's an increased risk of ectopic. Uh, it was also noted at this point that we weren't able to identify the marina coil threads. Um, a subsequent 12 week scan happened, which is figure two, and it was thought that the marina was in the subchorionic position. So throughout the pregnancy, the patient had further scans and at the next scan, uh, the marina was able to be visualised at all. So this led to an increase in monitoring from our team um, to monthly. So on the 28 week scan, it was thought that perhaps the marina was believed to be in the lower third of the uterus and again on the 30 week scan. Um, however, I would say that these images aren't particularly good quality. Um, and it is is difficult due to the planes obtained to really kind of definitively say where the marina is at this point. So with a case like this, we really had to adjust our management um, 
Otherwise, this patient would have been kind of a primaparous, a low risk patient under midwifery led care. Um, but given the circumstances, it was felt as appropriate to transfer her to um, consultant obstetrician care. Uh, the patient was counselled on the available options, so including um, risks of continuing the pregnancy, um, increased risk of preterm birth, um, potentially septic miscarriage um, and miscarriage and sepsis in pregnancy, in addition to the risk of miscarriage if the marina was removed. So we felt that this was really interesting because having a patient present with primary subfertility with the aim of achieving a healthy pregnancy, unfortunately we ended up in the scenario that the patient had, had become pregnant, which was excellent news, although it was now a high risk pregnancy and required some additional considerations. We also counseled the patient on the risk of congenital malformation or virilization of the fetus. So this is thought to be an incredibly low risk, although theoretically um, there have been concerns raised just because of the uh, intrauterine environment containing more um, female hormones and progesterone than, than normally expected. Um, and routine scanning uh, was initially proposed, which was increased monthly following difficulty with the visualization of the marina coil. We also had quite an in-depth discussion with the mode of uh, delivery with the patient who elected for elective C-section just due to the additional risks during the labour. And a neonatal presence at delivery was advised as well. So in our outcome, so uh, antenatally, the pregnancy was largely uncomplicated. Uh, the patient had a small resolving PV bleed in the first trimester, but following that with no complications. It was noted that the patient had low PAPE levels um, we didn't feel these had any clinical significance because the, the fetus had normal growth and there were no other concerns raised. Uh, in terms of delivery, so a healthy male infant was delivered at 39 weeks um, with cephalic presentation. And at this time, the uterine cavity was assessed interoperatively and it was felt um, to be regular, smooth with no palpable adhesions, which was significant for us um, due to the indication to put the marine in to prevent adhesion formation. Marina coil was recovered in interoperatively from the placental membranes and the patient achieved a normal blood loss during section. Uh, the neonatal review occurred and was unremarkable and there was no evidence of virilization. So following delivery, the uh, patient actually went back to routine post-operative management, which in the UK would be midwifery-led care. So talking more about uterine septum resection, so hysteroscopic metroplasy, including transcervicals resection, is the treatment of choice uh, for congenital uterine abnormalities, specifically, as I mentioned, for recurrent miscarriage, um, but also may be used in cases of primary subfertility. So it's considered a superior approach to transabdominal um, or laparotomy approaches just because of the general improved safety profile, such as reduced risk of infection, reduced hospital stay, reduced bleeding, um, and overall decreased mobility in um, a otherwise very well patient population. It's also considerably more cost effective um, considering the NHS is obviously a publicly funded system in the UK. However, it is noted that um, the effectiveness and possible complications of hysteroscopic metroplasy have never actually been tested in randomised control trials. So as I mentioned, um, due to their historical use and, and kind of theorised effect, Hysteroscopic uh, septum resection is commonly performed when no other cause can be found um, for a uterine se a septum. And many cases have reported success in their conception rates. So it's based on the pathophysiology that um, the septum in itself has quite an avascular nature and therefore has a poor response to estrogen. Um, and therefore this may inhibit successful implantation in addition to the further risks we know such as recurrent miscarriage and um, resulting from poor placental growth. So in this case, the pregnancy was ultimately complicated not by the septum resection itself, but by the use of the marina coil as an adjunctive treatment. So hormonal and barrier adjuncts to the procedure are often added, again, with the aim of preventing adhesion formation um, by recreating a kind of hormone-rich environment um, for the natural anatomy to reform. Um, and again, that's partly based on what we know about Ashman syndrome, so reduction in fertility potential with adhesions, increased miscarriage rates and pregnancy morbidity. Um, 
how have we do recognise that adhesions following hysteroscopic reception may be less significant than something seen in Ashman syndrome? So it's also, again, an important consideration um, when thinking about a patient's um, suitability for adjunctive treatments. And following our um, literature research as well, it was very clear that um, there's, there's no particular guideline and there's lots of debate in the literature over which specific adjunct is actually most beneficial um, in preventing adhesion formation. And in fact, some studies showed that there were no um, improvement or added protection at all. So despite that, as I mentioned, it's still commonly used, um, partly due to historical use, but also because of reported cases that um, some suggest there is a benefit. And a Cochrane review of 560 women across eight studies did show fewer intrauterine adhesions at a second look hysteroscopy, um, although in the Cochrane review it was noted that quality of evidence was um, considered to be low in that study. So in our case specifically, this patient achieved pregnancy. Uh, so it's not really fully possible to evaluate the benefit of the marina in terms of adhesion formation. Um, however, it is positive, of course, that at the time of intrauterine assessment, uh, there were no palpable adhesions felt. So we also considered marina coil more widely, as although not directly related to our case, um, as our case is believed to be an early luteal phase pregnancy, a similar scenario may arise from true marina coil failure, although we recognise this is rare with an average pearl rate of 0.1 um, in the literature, sorry. So the pearl rate is um, based on 100 years of use um, at the time the contraception is started and then take into consideration either finishing of the study or um, discontinuation of the contraception itself. Um, and again, as we said, although less relevant to our important consideration. So more widely considered, there's quite a lot of learning perhaps that can be done from this case. Um, in terms of our patients locally, so now we're undergoing hysteroscopic uterine septum resection. There's very clear advice not to have any unprotective intercourse from their last menstrual period until after their resection, or if they do so, to use another method of contraception. We continue to use the pre-procedure uh, urine pregnancy test, although in this case that was negative and was taken as, as so. Um, but we recognise um, potential limits of that in the case of early pregnancy. And we also now counsel all our patients on the risk of pregnancy in the presence of a cited recoil due to non-abstinence pre-procedure or indeed contraceptive failure. Uh, where possible, the procedure uh, can be timed in the early follicular phase to avoid um, such instances and cases happen again. Although we also recognise that's more an ambitious aim given um, kind of the constraints of the NHS system which we work in and our patients and um, doctors availability as well to perform the procedure. And more than this, we considered kind of assessment of marina coil and other adjuncts and their suitability for our patients. In addition to um, uterine septum resection for primary subfertility more widely. So in conclusion, we report an unusual case of an early luteal phase pregnancy occurring with the marina coil in situ, following a hysteroscopic septum resection in a 27-year-old female. So following our literature search, we were also able to conclude that no such case is previously reported, suggesting that there is a gap in the literature surrounding this potential scenario and its management. Following this, we also conclude that large-scale randomised control trials are really needed to fully assess the benefits of both uterine septum resection and the role of adjunctive treatments in primary subfertility patients due to the lack of high-quality large-scale evidence in this. And lastly, uh, we did note that although there were no structural or detrimental effects on this fetus um, in this case, there's also a relative lack of evidence on that subject as well, just because of the small sample sizes of previously reported cases. So I list my references there for any further reading. And just like to really um, acknowledge and thank the patient who gave permission for the use of their case and, and medical images for uh, teaching research purposes for the publication of this case report and also our wider research team. Um, I've also just included there some further reading. So um, these are updated guidelines on um, 
kind of congenital uterine abnormalities in their management by the Royal College of Obstetric Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK and um, hysteroscopic metroplasy um, guidance as well by NICE, uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence of the UK. So many thanks and um, any questions at all. Thank you, Dr. Natasha, for uh, sharing your valuable research work and the course.